having a studio mate that's as driven as you are and making work and pursuing a, a body of work and artistic career and sort of thinking conceptually about work, yeah. um, it, it's it's really it's really nice to have like a real time conversation with someone with making a work of art, but also have the same goals um, and and be completely obsessed with it, completely yeah. immersed in it, and something we do all the time and think about all the time. Um, and we work do work really really differently. You know, my table's really dirty, hers is very clean. Um, but it's nice also to have someone that's making work that's entirely different than yours, you know, with, with their own influences and, you know, history and ideas behind it. Um, yeah. I think, I think having the work out in the space, too, though it's sometimes a practical matter of, like, we need somewhere to put the work, um, to actually live with it and have it and to think about it in new ways or think about the arrangements or or how to display the work um, and seeing how, how Christian does that as well in his work. I think um, it's it's inspiring to sort of have that constantly be around. Yeah. It's, it's easier to have a linkage to a, a ongoing body of work when you constantly see it all the time. And that sort of inherently makes its way into into what you're going to go do in the studio after leaving the living room, you know, and, and you may not realize it immediately, but it, it sort of seeps out. The same way that I feel that we influence each other, it may not be as evident up front, but um, eventually you start to see some of these, you know, her form may make its way into my vessel. I was just thinking, like, what, what helps a form to stand? How does um, a thing stay balanced. Um, so I'm interested in that sometimes precarious relationship of like, how does a wall stand up? Does it need a sort of like buttress or, uh, you know, other wall supporting it? Is it another piece supporting it? Um, or does it fall over and that kind of becomes the, the new way that it exists? And, and I think too, in, you know, digging into these architectural elements uh, of a wall, of an arc, I'm interested in sort of these like slow modifications of a form, like what happens when you have an arc when you bend it slightly? What happens when you bend it a little more? How does light interact with that in a way that's different based on the context? So like when this piece sort of like catches light in a certain way, I'm interested in that, like the shadow space that, that happens there. Um, then there is like a, I guess a sort of slow, serial, repetitive way that I work uh, with these forms that, uh, I think playing with them in relationship to one another is um, a way for me to kind of get to new to new places in them. Uh, for this form specifically, you know, I'm thinking about the like, enclosure of a form, the space that it holds in, inside of it. I'm thinking of, I've made some earlier tile forms of maybe having those forms sort of sit within that space and creating an environment for it to exist within. Um, that's still sort of in the experimental trying to figure it out phase, but um, that's something I've been I've been thinking about. It's important for me that they feel organic. Um, another option to build up a wall might be to you know roll out a slab and to have that sort of stand up. Um, but I like that the the building up of the form comes from me sort of piece by piece adding that clay to it, and so to actually just leave it to be my hand in the way of my way of making it and to trust that and to feel like that's okay like um it being made from me is uh to be um i've settled into that and to to feeling com comfortable and with with that way of working oftentimes I'll, I'll make drawings either of the the sort of overview of the form um but yeah it is like a little piece of clay that I'm adding together. I do also work in sort of maquette studies, like smaller forms, there are some over there, which maybe we can zoom in later, um, of a way of working to sort of figure out what that form might be. Um, but yeah, it is sort of like a piece by piece clay uh, getting put together. Um, but I, in, in, in starting, I am interested in that aerial view of the piece, though it might not always be viewed from that vantage point. That's sort of my plotting line of like, a way to enter the piece is well what does what's the sort of like letter that it creates on the the surface that it might exist on i think about the experience of the body and what that would be like in um in viewing or experiencing a larger piece i think my hope is that they yeah they contain the body but they contain other things too whether that's um an organic form a natural form whether it's um, plant life or human life like that there is that the the 
the loose boundary between those things at times. It's, it's a nice challenge to think um, what would a monumental piece look like because I you know these these aren't studies for larger pieces uh, for me they they don't exist in that way growing up in Florida which is such a lush landscape um, uh, you know so much green nature there like that I think inherently had an influence in my work and for a while in my painting I was painting uh, in the landscape both in Florida and other places where I lived so that sort of like direct immediate uh, experience of a place and a natural landscape um, definitely has had an influence in my work. Um, in my studio for a while, I had a dried sea grape leaf hanging up on the wall just as that sort of um, like representation of uh, a place of these like coastal dunes in, in Sarasota, Florida that I grew up around. It was a plant that was at my parents' house, but I, I just was really drawn to this like dried leaf form that connected me to that place. Um, later in making the work, it was, um, in the hindsight, sort of seeing that my work was almost turning into the leaf in a way of like of these linen paintings that you know had that sort of like organic texture to them, and then like a tiled form that also had this sort of um, curved, uh, slightly warped quality, like a leaf does when it dries. Um, so maybe there are these sort of natural elements of place that that influenced me in the work. I know when I was most um, recently home in Florida, I was collecting um, like dried palm tree husks and um, like dried leaves as well. And just feeling like these are like really beautiful forms in themselves and they feel complete that they don't need um, anything else to happen. And what would it be to make a piece that maybe had that sort of quality? It's not quite a living thing, but it might have the potential to be that. I think growing up, sort of these ideas of culture and language and color and how people arrange their homes and um, even fix up their homes sort of layered upon each other. Uh, I feel like the most impact though came from my mom's house and how she like arranges her altars and the swap meet, like my relationship with objects and how they create sort of segments within a timeline of my life. Um, I think one of the interesting things about how her altars operate are that She'll have a religious icon next to a stuffed animal next to random sort of objects that she picks up at yard sales or just would find at the swamp meet. And there's no hierarchy between them. They all mean something because they like trigger some sense of a memory. You know, they're, it's ephemera that like is important, therefore it belongs. And I feel like that's how the swamp meet operates too. And then years later, it sort of made itself into the way that I make arrangements, to the way I think of like objects, the way I sort of hoard things. I, I love junk, I love objects, I love like collecting things, and I think um, it's ultimately in the most genuine way sort of manifesting itself in my artwork and compiling these things, these objects that are loaded symbolism, iconography. So things like this um, are trigger memory in a sense, you know. I, 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 one, I love square, and it's something I continually drink to currently, but these specific bottles and just the way that this feels within my hand, it, it brings a familiar memory. You know, I, I remember going down to Mexico. We would go down somewhat frequently during the holidays and sitting outside of my grandma's store um, and holding like these glass bottles, this and the Coca-Cola bottle, like the, the way it feels in my hand, the weight of it um, is very familiar. And I think being able to get these here but also thinking about how that feels within my fingers and in my hand and how I could maybe use that in a work of art. Um, I've been currently melting down stained glass, but realizing that the colorant in this bottle can also be utilized for that. Um, but also having that sense of history, that, that's an aspect where I could like then further apply symbolism and memory into the work. I want to make objects that are somewhat universal that anyone can sort of grasp. And I think things like this have similar meaning to a multitude of people that know what the bottle looks like, know <clears throat> where you could purchase this, maybe even have a, a history with it and like traveling back to Mexico or living in Mexico. So the, the Saints came about sort of critiquing um, this aspect of belief in like objects and especially like the commodity of them um, and mass production of objects that have some religious value but also how I could create things that have a specific shape and texture and call them a saint and someone could like 
immediately by that. Uh, the first iteration of the Saints were actually made with like Batman and Robin's capes and had multiple heads. Um, this newer one, um, so these are decapitated, uh, but these are Peyton Manning and a dog. You know, so th this idea that like I could sort of interchange things and automatically give them some sense of like personal value um, comes from like what I mentioned earlier. This this idea of like no hierarchy between objects. You know, this this sort of compiling a personal attachment to objects and u utilizing those within like this idea of a st saint, which is more or less just like a a, a um, texture that resembles fabric. Um, it's a humorous way to like look at a very serious thing, but I think it's sort of opened the door for me to like take other objects and like immediately like make something funny out of them. Um, at times, it, it references very serious things, but for the most part, it's it's like an ongoing sort of vessel, in a sense, or a, an object that I could quickly attach something to, and it's like a nice standalone. A lot of these objects, like like that's mentioned Peyton Manning. Uh, Peyton Manning comes from like my history at the University of Tennessee where he was a quarterback at during college. People worship him there, you know? So this idea that like there is love and belief and like faith and attachment put behind just ordinary individuals. Um, about three years ago, I had a, a problem with my ankle where um, they discovered tumors in it where I had to have the tumors removed. Um, and went through an extensive surgery that fused my ankle together. So I moved to making animation something I could do, draw in bed, draw at the coffee table or at the dinner table, and um, stopped, started working in stop motion animation because I still needed to make work for graduate school. And in that sense, I started thinking more about narrative and how to make these sort of individual frames, 24 frames per second, drawings, how to create these storylines, still utilizing a lot of the things I was making in the studio, but transform them into this animation sense. After I could walk again, I immediately went back to the studio, and, and I've only been working in clay since then, but I wanted to take some aspect of that, of those thousands and thousands of drawings I made over those six months and incorporate them into the clay in the sense of like trying to capture movement, which is something that's been done throughout history or attempted at least throughout history, going all the way back to, you know, early primitive cave paintings, to Egyptian hieroglyphics, to Italian futurism, um, and even, you know, early motion pictures. And doing so in a way that it's captured within the round and these vessels. I started making these pots that were intended to hold plants that had these narratives on them. They were embellished with all these sort of humorous figures and very colorful things. Um, I'm revisiting that now or with like diving deeper into research of thinking of like Roman friezes and Greek pottery and also Egyptian hieroglyphics and Aztec pattern and how I could, you know, reincorporate some of these things that I'm influenced by into the work, but also, um, sort of break them down, make them simpler, uh, make them my own, and use symbolic references from animations I made years ago and how I could place those on these pots, these sort of objects in the round that you would walk around and thinking about that and being a um, movie narrative, almost like a movie. So that's, that's how I think of them. I'm actually re referring to the new pots as empty columns, as something that could be utilitarian for the use of a pot, but more so, is a vessel that holds a lot of these other symbolic iconography and motifs that I use in work. Living with the work, especially living with my work and, and it being on display all the time, I, I think it sort of camouflages itself into the living room, so I don't necessarily always see it when I'm staring at it. It like becomes part of it. Um, and I think, I think that's almost the best way to, to live with it and work with it because I think that's the more sort of genuine and organic way that it can make its way into other things. Um, and because of the specific arrangements between objects and, and how they are next to each other at times, I realize that those objects need to live next to each other permanently and like that now becomes one piece. And that's when I sort of start recycling these things, um, potentially even breaking them, reglazing them, gluing them together with stained glass, something I've been doing recently. Making an art, art object that's utilitarian is really great. And I think in some of the, the works that I make, they 
um, they sort of resemble almost like a half pot shape. Like they are sort of these walled curved vessels. Um, so, I, you know, recently I, I did make some ceramic pots to, you know, specifically for some of our, our house plants to exist in, but it did feel like a continuation of the forms that I'm making, building up the wall of the vessel, um, though giving it, um, you know, a bottom to, uh, to hold the, the dirt in. But um, I like thinking of like the space uh, between objects, this, the the vessel sort of acting as like a container or a boundary between a thing. There was like one pot form that I made that didn't have a bottom to it, so I'm also thinking like how can I sort of use those elements as of a vessel and sort of break them or rearrange them or slightly modify them, uh, continuing sort of like an architectural structure in a way. What happens when it doesn't have that function? We're excited to have Zeba Rajavi's work in this space for the month of October. Um, Zeba is from Iran, but she currently lives in Arkansas. And so her work is really dealing with those memories that she has from Iran connected to architecture. Uh, she even mentions furniture as being an influence for the work and um, that she investigates in paintings, drawings, and sort of tapestries. The more time we spend in the space um, looking at these works, they sort of start to transform from color pencil on paper drawings into appearing more as tapestries. Uh, the color pencil, the way that the mark is made and how heavy it's applied on there, almost starts to appear like thread. Um, so the closer that you look at it, it almost starts to appear as if it's like colored um, yarn woven into a piece of paper. It's a really beautiful sort of delicate process that's being captured there. I think in, in, in thinking about Ziba's work for this space um, and having uh, you know early studio visits with her and talking about the work, uh, thinking about her work specifically with the, the color and the patterning um, in sort of relationship to the space, um, both as like an intimate space and experiencing these works, um, having the plants in the space sort of coexist with her, um, these really sensitively made uh, works on paper in addition to the light that comes in the space? A lot of the non-traditional art spaces that we're really excited about to take place in people's homes or even backyards. Um, and it, when looking for an apartment, we talked a lot about if we were able to find a place that had an extra bedroom, what we wanted to do with that. And I think it was important going into this pandemic and now living in the middle of it, sort of having to say what art sh should be shown um, or having some aspect of control over that. When I lived in Tennessee, I started uh, co-founded a gallery in my backyard garage space. And that was another instance of looking for a place to live specifically that could um, have a gallery space connected to it. Um, and so in that space, you know, I, that it was, it was a garage space, but it, it almost had elements of a barn a little bit more so in that it had a dirt floor. Um, we needed to repaint the walls white and build doors because I didn't have doors at the time. Um, but seeing that art can exist sort of in those non-traditional spaces and inviting artists whose work that we thought could kind of uh, work or be challenged by or challenged in that space. We have different answers and we practice. <laughs> <laughs>